Welcome to the Board Game Marketing Podcast. Let's cue the intro. This is the number one podcast to learn marketing strategies for your board game. Whether you're just starting on your first game or an experienced designer, you've come to the right place. My name is Nalin, and let's talk marketing for your game. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Board Game Marketing Podcast. In this podcast, I interview creators who have successfully funded their ideas on Kickstarter to learn more about their journey to launch and help you formulate your own plan. I also bring on experts in the tabletop space to talk about all the facets of marketing and building your game publishing company. If you've been listening for a while now, you know that I hold nothing back. So in these episodes, be prepared to hear me ask the hard questions and really get down to the finer details. Let's get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Board Game Marketing Podcast. Today, we're so lucky to have Dan on the show, and I'm so, so psyched for everything that he's going to be sharing with us today. So Dan, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great. So, you know, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and also about your incredible project before we get into the details of the marketing of it. Yeah, cool. Uh, So I run a company called Cloud Puncher Games, um, and we created the Box Throne back in 2017. Uh, Maybe your listeners have seen our ads. Um, It's for a modular board game shelving system. Uh, And so in 2017, we raised a, a including Crydox, we raised over a million dollars. And then uh, we are now, or like we just finished, but uh, running a, the campaign for Token Sesame, which is a modular token and board game bit holder. That's amazing. You know, you're creating all these different accessories for the tabletop space that mm-hmm. everyone, are, you know, they're just dying to have. So I'd love to really, before we go into the marketing, to talk about, you know, how you came up with these ideas and how the product is kind of, um, came about. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I've been playing board games since I was, like, five years old, right? So, like, uh, basically, how I uh, came up with these ideas, I just was living life, playing board games, saw an opportunity, thought, like, oh, I think I can probably make this better, or, like, I wonder if I could make something like this. Um, so, for example, with, like, with, like, Box on 2017, you know, like, I was looking for, like, a new, uh, like, a, a board game shelving unit i guess you know and i saw like calax and like all the the ikea options and i just i just didn't like them because i wanted to store every single board game horizontally and i wanted to have a system where it's like i could slide one board game off without um you know having to take it out of the bottom of a stack and stuff like that so i designed this giant modular shelving system um and so we ran that and then with token sesame it was like i had i, had, I was looking for like a like basically token bit holders and i was like on amazon and i saw like a a google token holder and one of the first things that came up with was called it was like ultimate token holder and it was basically just little transparent plastic bowls i'm like is that really ultimate is that and so like i I just went about designing something i don't know a little bit more interesting i think than just like those kind of like those boring bowls so like token sesame it's a it's like a completely a modular uh token holder like you can reconfigure it into a bunch of different ways to adapt to any table. Like for example, if you have a really crowded table, um, we, we have like two or three different configurations where you can save it like a ton of space. Um, there's one that has a handle on it so you can pick it up and give it to someone. There's one that has like a, a lazy Susan style carousel on it. So you can easily access stuff. There's one that has uh, like legs coming off the bottom of it. So, you know, you can have all your tokens raised up above the actual game itself. So kind of like the level up a little bit, if you've seen that Kickstarter as well. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, and then like I have it compactable into a travel mode too that comes with a lid and a travel bag. And, and then it has like uh, basically uh, like removable and attachable art plates on them too done by famous board game artists. And so I spent like maybe like six months uh, getting um, like just connecting with different artists from like some of my favorite Kickstarter board games. And then getting them to design art plates for, for token Sesame. And so like, we got, we got a ton on there. We have like the artist uh, from our return to dark tower, Christina Clita, and then uh, Andrew Bosley, um, you know, from Everdell, um, Alexander Elichev from Gloomhaven, Frosthaven, 
um, like just tons like Jackie Davis from, you know, like Viticulture and Euphoria. Um, and so, yeah, we have like 15 different artists um, who've all done different art plates for it. Um, anyway, yeah. So <laughs> we just, it kind of started as like this uh, replacement for like those board game bit hole, hole uh, board game uh, bit holders, like bowls basically. Uh, and then just went out of control. I love that you were talking about how you saw something and you were like, wait a minute, I could probably do something, you know, in a more kind of revolutionary, innovative way. Yeah. And just yeah. I f- it. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's like basically a, a, a lot of how I come up with different products and stuff like that. Like I have like two more uh, like board game Kickstarter accessories coming out um within the next like year and a half um and it's it was the exact same way i'm just like what is that really the best i think i could do one better um i guess it's just competitive but (laughs) yeah so i kind of want to dig in a little bit more about this like you know the Mm. creation process here a lot of people who want to create things you know for the tabletop space they have all these ideas but they don't know where to get started you know like Mm -hmm. how did you get started from taking that idea and just start you know, did you just draw sketches? Did you hire someone to sketch some for you? Did, did you like just, you know, immediately fly to China and just found factory? Like how, how did it all happen? Yeah, like um, basically I started um, reading like Jamie uh, Stegmeyer's blogs, you know, forever ago. You know, the, the, um, he has this whole uh, hundred blogs or something about like how to get started with Kickstarter. And he kind of like talks a bit about how to start um, like a board game company from scratch, right? And so I kind of took a lot of those principles and used that as a foundation um, of how to kind of run a board game accessory company a little bit. So I basically started when it's just like, I just like have a random idea. I'm just like, oh, like, oh, what if, what if I create a new board game shop? And yeah, so basically it started with just like, I just hand drew some sketches of a whole bunch of ideas, came up with a list of requirements, found an industrial designer, talked to them through what, what they wanted, and basically spent a couple months kind of like narrowing down all these different options and and all this stuff to create one that is like a like a design that is uh what is it called uh ready to manufacture not ready to manufacture um oh designed from designed from manufacture it's like a special term that means like the design has to be uh cost efficient to produce um like you can very easily add random stuff in a design that doesn't make any sense and just like we'll, we'll put the cost to the roof and the thing is that you need to work with an industrial designer who knows how to design for manufacture otherwise you'll have um, uh, basically just costs in manufacturing later that you, you didn't expect um, anyway so so yeah just like work with an industrial designer from the scratch from, from scratch come up with like those CAD files basically uh, in the end like an STP file 3D file and that you just uh, after that just start going to Alibaba or trying to find different factories um and uh just send the messages be like yo how much does it cost i want i want to make you know a thousand of these um and like you can't really be timid about uh sharing the the design with people like you can't go around asking people to sign ndas and all that kind of stuff no factory is going to copy your stuff because like you basically haven't proved that it would be successful yet so like i sent all my designs to you know 15 20 different factories you know um no no one's created a copycat yet that i know of but um yeah so uh so yeah just do that and then get some quotes back and then you can start prototyping and the prototyping process is just like it's crazy like i'm very lucky that i found a a factory here who the guy just like works so hard it's it's crazy never never seen anyone work like this like you'll be working till like 3 a.m on different tweaks the design to make it perfect like for example token sesame every little piece had to fit together like perfectly right like one little measurement was off it wouldn't work in like half the configurations we envisioned um, because it's like, it's like all these little like bowls with these little pegs and stuff and they can be clipped together. And then we want to have them stacking and all this kind of stuff. Right. Um, so the design design has to be absolutely precise. Um, and so we spent this thing, like honestly six months, like I suppose to launch it like a year and a half ago. <laughs> we spent so long just like tweaking stuff and perfecting it. And so I worked with this, with, with this factory owner uh, on doing it. I guess he's more of a designer. Um, and he, he's worked with uh, Kate Spade and stuff like that in the past. So he knew uh, these like high-end manufacturing techniques for uh, printing on like plastic or different materials and stuff like that. 
So basically from that is where I kind of got the idea. I'm like, oh, I can print some pretty sweet designs on this thing too. And so um, he's the one who kind of like was behind the idea of, or like has, has the method for printing like those, those uh, board game artist designs on top of the art plates and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so anyway, I worked with him for like six months uh, getting the pr prototypes done. And uh, if you're working with a plastic product, it's like a couple different ways you can do it. You can either get like 3D printed, but then it looks terrible on like in videos and photos and stuff like that. Or you get a hand mold. The hand mold is usually 10 times the cost of the final product. So like say you're making a product for, I don't know, $20, like that hand mold, it's even more than that, to be honest. If you're making a product for like $20, it's gonna cost you like almost $2,000 to get that thing. And the crazy thing is that it's like, I got my hand molds made like like six months before um, before the launch of, of of the Kickstarter, but the hand molded product that I made it cost cost two thousand dollars of it. I left it in my apartment before I went on vacation and came back, and uh, our cleaner had thrown it out because it was in a, like a box and it was covered in styrofoam stuff like that. So. She just like threw out this two thousand dollar <laughs> token sesame prototype. I'm like, that was gonna be for my photos. And so after that happened, I was just like, ah, oh, okay, whatever. Let's get the final molds made. And then so like that's a, that's the next step, right? You just get the final molds made, which usually costs you anything from like ten to eighty thousand um, dollars, depending on what you're making. And then uh, they make these final molds that you can use over and over and over again. And so I'm like, yeah, I'll just, I'll just get them done. Like I, I, I'm gonna commit to this project anyway. So. So then that took another three, four months to do. So that's why I was, was very delayed in doing it in, in getting the project out there. And then when you have like your, your molds out, um, that's pretty much what the final product is going to look like. So, and that, that's, why, that's why I like doing that too. Again, paying for the final mold up front so that in the Kickstarter videos and the photos and stuff like that, you don't have to use renders or any of that stuff. You can just actually show people what it actually looks like and show people interacting with it. And I think that's very important for a Kickstarter accessory as well. Like people need to see what it looks like interacting with the product. Like you can't just show people um, your renders and stuff like that. I mean, like, you, you know, you probably know that from like a marketing perspective too, right? It's, it's all about, it's more about what the experience makes people feel like than the actual product. So if you show people enjoying it and using it in a way that other people can envision themselves using it, that's going to do a lot better than just showing people the product. Yeah. Thanks for going through kind of the whole kind of conceptualization and kind of prototyping and like figuring out the CAD rendering, like all that process in really detail here for people who are new and really want to create something physical, right? So yeah. in this process, where, when do you start kind of showing it to people? When do you start kind of getting feedback from people and, and seeing like, hey, is this going to be something that other gamers want? Yeah, I mean, like, I think you have to be careful with it too, though. Like, um, yeah, so like with... I think a better example for this one would be like Box Throne, like our, our first product. Um, with that one, we, uh, I went, I basically posted on Reddit when it was half done. Uh, it wasn't half done, but like I basically had the basic system designed. I didn't have any add-ons designed. And so I went on Reddit with it and it posted there. And Reddit just like, just, they just like tore it apart. They're like, oh, we don't need anything but Calyx. It's like a religion, honestly, around Calyx. It's crazy. I'm like, we don't, we don't need it. Like, wow. like wh why would we do it? If we, we can get, you know, shells for, you know, like, like $50 or whatever from there. Why would we spend, um, you know, $200 on, on a shelf? I'm just like, well, this is like, these, these are the reasons why. Like, these are the functions that the box on has that the Calyx doesn't have. Um, and just go through it with like, uh, but then I just sat, sat back and just let them, let them kind of like have at it. Uh, and this is on the front page of Reddit, by the way. Like it was so controversial when I first posted the box on stuff that it was like the front, it was like one of the most upvoted uh, posts on slash our board games in that year. Um, it was like 3000 upvotes. Um, it was so controversial that they deleted, the mods deleted the post. <laughs> and, then, and then it made a big, big rant about it with the mods and then they put it back up there. But by then it was, I don't know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't on the front page anymore, but um, I basically let people have at it. And it's some of the ideas I came out with out, out of their discussions I actually used in the final Kickstarter. And so one person was like, oh, like I feel like this would be really good for minis, but you know, the shelves don't, uh, the shelves are, are wire shelves. So like I would know, no, have nowhere to put the minis. And like, I'd love to use this as a, as a display case, but 
like and someone would be like oh well, why don't you make different shelves and someone would be like oh like you, you say it's like a ultimate game storage um system yet you don't have anywhere to store like play mats and all this kind of stuff right and i'm like oh okay interesting so i just took all of that feedback and I just made add-ons uh using all that feedback like i made uh transparent glass-like acrylic shelves to go into the system that would be used for displaying minis i made play mat holders and stuff like that i made drawers for dnd players to store their character sheets and all this kind of stuff um so i, I feel like if to get back to the main point like i feel like once you have like your basic i basic product made i feel like that point it's good to go to reddit with it if you're planning on doing something with a lot of add-ons especially just go just go there and, and see what they say about it um and i think that you're gonna get a lot of hate i think like generally like reddit's just like it's generally like a critical community crit- yeah a community of critics um which isn't bad um i i feel like yeah like you get to see what someone who maybe isn't on your side from the get-go like what they would think about it and then from there you can start thinking about how you can get them on your side right um so so yeah i feel like for 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 token sesame it was like it was more like an out-of-the-box kind of product like i did post on reddit and i got like a lot of positive feedback i didn't actually get that much critical stuff like uh critique and stuff like that um I, the more critique and stuff or like more feedback I've got is from my own community that I've built with Cloud Puncher Games. Like I have a, a basically like a box thrown community now. Um, it's about 20,000 people in it. Um, and so, and so I was able to get feedback from them and stuff like that. And I, I kind of wish I'd done it a little bit earlier because they, uh, they had good ideas for the art plates that they wanted and stuff like that. Um, and I kind of implement like, so I had 13 already set up and they're like, oh, we kind of want, you know, it's just something more like subtle as well. And so I'm like, oh, okay. So like I quickly went back to some of the designers. Like I went to Peter Walken from the Dinosaur Island and uh, Alexander Elichev of Gloomhaven. I'm like, okay, guys, I want one that's just like plain, like wood and iron. You know, people want something very subtle that can be used in like a bunch of different games. So wood and iron that can be used in a bunch of games. And then like Peter, I want from you, like just like, uh, I call it depths of space, like just just a general space nebula background that we can use in space games like that. And so it, he like they came up with those pretty quick during the campaign. But um, I think that if I was going to run a second token sesame campaign, I'd probably like do it all that kind of like genetic, more subtle type. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it'd be interesting. Um, I, I am planning on doing a. Another, at least another run of art plates, new designs, because everything in Token Sesame is like a limited edition as well. That's what I designed it to be. I want it to be kind of like uh, pop figures, like how, uh, like those um, Funko Funko pop figures, if you know them. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of them are like limited edition, right? And they're very collectible. So it's kind of how I designed these art plates. You know, they all go into window boxes and, you know, I have a limited run of each one. Like I don't think I'll be making more than like 500 of each type um after the kickstarter so i I do want to make it so people who have it feel special that you know they were able to get on board in this limited time and then i'll continue selling maybe about six of them out of the 15 and so yeah i just i just really want to create that limited edition feeling for people but yeah wow yeah thanks for kind of going through all that of like when people you know when you're kind of showing ideas to people and when Mm -hmm. you're getting feedback and, you know, with these two examples, you know, with Box Drone, you, you took a lot of those ideas and implemented it. And then with Token Sesame, you, you're, you know, thinking about a long-term kind of multi-high launch with the same product, mm-hmm. with all this feedback that people are giving. So that's, that's incredible. So with this said, like, how, how did you kind of build up that community, you know, for Box Drone and also for mm-hmm. this Token Sesame one? How are you building up a community that, you know, was so engaged and so large that, you know, you were funded in no time at all and continue to really just crush it with your launch. Yeah, like for the, for Boxstone, I think it was, um, like basically how I started building that community was just from an email list. And I started building an email list using Board Game Geek ads and uh, Facebook giveaways. And I did that until I had about 5,000 people on that list or maybe even less, maybe it was even 3,000. And then I launched it. And then a lot, like the thing about, I guess the products I've designed, um, uh, it's kind of based around word of mouth, right? Like you think about when you make a board game, it's like you have to play it 
for people at the table to kind of spread the message of it by word of mouth, if that makes sense. Um, like you can't turn people into advocates of your product unless they use it, right? But with the box thrown, it's sitting in someone's living room, like right there, you can't, you can't ignore it. So everyone who goes over to someone's house sees this thing and asks about it. And so, um, and so honestly, that's how, that's how this community, how my community and uh, how the business is like is, is built actually. It's mostly word of mouth, like, um, and returning customers too, because it's like a modular system. Um, but, but yeah, so people go there, see it, be like, oh, okay, I'll like find out more about it. They come to the website. Uh, if they don't, you know, buy their own system, then maybe they'll at least like follow us on Instagram or Facebook. Um, so, so yeah. And like, for example, on our Instagram and stuff like that, we, we made like a, almost like an interior design kind of reel as well of like people who've used the board, box on board game shelves in their living room. Like our Instagram handle is just board game shelves. Um, so basically anyone who's like tagging like board game shelves and stuff like that will maybe come across our, our Instagram. Um, and then, yeah, we have like a highlight reel in there and people just go in there and just like look through and like, Oh yeah, I do like these color combos and all this kind of stuff. And we're continuing to like create new add-ons for box zone and like upgrade the website and stuff like that. Um, so, so anyway, yeah, I, I also think like a big factor of creating community as well is that you need to feel like a holistic brand experience to people as well. So like, if you're just, uh, like, I don't know, one dude and you have a product and it's like kind of a not super special product and there's nothing about it that gets people interested, you'll have a difficult time building a community, um, unless you can add in a bit of like branding spice to it. So even if I think you have like a boring product, like say paper towels, you know, you have a paper towel company. If you just create like, um, you know, a, like a mascot characters around it, uh, you start talking to customers in a certain way, you have taglines and, and sign offs and stuff like that. People get a lot more excited about it, which is what we're trying to do with, like, with box throne, for example. Um, I just keep using the boxing idea because I think it's, uh, it's kind of like how it got started. Um, but, you know, it, it's a shelving system. It's really, it's just furniture. You know, furniture isn't that exciting. Um, but what we did is that we created a whole kind of universe around it called the Box Kingdom and is ruled by the Box King. Um, and so the Box King is like a little, you know, big headed, square headed mascot. Um, and, you know, he's everywhere. You know, if you buy Box Zone, you get stickers uh, with, with the Box King on it. Um, I got the Box King and all the videos and all this kind of stuff. And um, emails that go out to people is kind of the voice is in, not the Box King's voice, but a servant of the Box King's voice. And so, like, we uh, always address people by like we're trying to get involved in the in the the universe so you know i'll never say dear customer it'd always be like your majesty or your highness or noble you know noble now and you know like like we got a new a new product on sale or something like that right like we'll we'll try and get uh we have like a very specific voice and it's all kind of in that medieval kind of tongue-in-cheek voice and stuff like that uh and so, so yeah, and then we, it kind of extend, extends to token sesame and stuff too. Like for that one, like I had the, the box, the box scene was a big factor in that too. Like for stretch goals, I don't know if you, you saw it, but we did stretch goals. Um, like Jamie Steckmeyer actually gives a shout out on his blog about the, the way we did stretch goals for it. Um, it was uh, a choose your own adventure story. So like for backers, right? So like they would choose between, you know, they find a time travel device and do they go to the future or do they go to the past? And depending on which one they choose, it unlocks like a special set of art plates related to that choice. So say they go to the future and then they unlock Jackie Davis's like cyberpunk um, art plates for the token Sesame system. You know, they go to the past and then they unlock like a, a more like, you know, unspoiled nature kind of art plate um so so yeah so we had this like choose your own adventure system and that was you know that featured the box king and it took place in the box kingdom and kind of built more in that universe and stuff like that so people became more familiar with it um and then it, even in the voice and stuff like that we would if it was to do with that we would tell people like oh like welcome explorers and all this kind of stuff and then outside of that we still use like you know your majesty and all this kind of stuff um just to build, just to get people to feel like they're involved in that universe. And I feel like it worked very well. Like I've had a lot of people who like will message me and just say like, like I'll support anything you do. Like they just love like what we've, what we've built and stuff like that. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I don't know. I think it's, uh, 
I, yeah, I think that really project. speaks to, to how strong um, of community the community that you built. You know, you built that entire world up, and then there's so many ways that people can interact with the, the community. You know, even through an email, they're they're hearing this voice on all the social media things that you're doing. You're, they're seeing certain types of images that you're kind of curating for the world that you're building. And mm. you know, the, the stronger you know, you're, you're able to do this on all facets, you know, everything that's surrounding them in like a 360 manner, the more they're immersed with the game, the more they're, well, the product and the more they're immersed with the world. And mm-hmm. I really love how you're, you're doing that. And you're able to carry that across the different games too. And I guess that, this leads me to the next question. Like, how did you kind of for, you know, for a second time creator now, how did you leverage your first, uh, I guess, uh, crowd or audience from, from Box Throne and, mm-hmm take them into Token Sesame and, and did a lot of them back Token Sesame too? Or how did you kind of approach these second kind of product launch? Yeah, like, I, so Token Sesame raised $400,000. Probably $100,000 was from people who also owned a box of them. Um, like we raised uh, like $100,000 in like the first 48 hours. Uh, and that was all from from basically box their own uh, customers or people involved in it. That's incredible. Um, yeah. So uh, I just, I have like a big mailing list from, from box on. Um, and so basically like I, you know, email them, I have a couple of different groups, um, you know, for, for box on stuff, you know, I pin it to that, um, you know, like uh, the, the board game shelves, Instagram has like almost 4,000 followers. You know, I post there regularly, a lot of Instagram stories and stuff like that too. Um, and so, yeah, basically just like, it's just more of a communication thing, I think, in leveraging your, your previous audience, uh, like, yeah, get people hyped for it too, right? Like, um, when I'm telling people, like, cause, cause it, there's an intersectionality between, um, the two different products, right? So like, it's in essence, it's still storage, right? An organization. And so people who are interested in board game organization, keeping a clean tabletop are going to probably be interested in, in token Sesame, um, and so uh, I would kind of like hit on that and stuff like that and emails and stuff like that, you know, like take your, your st- storage to the next level and you know, take your organization to the next level, um, keep your kingdom clean and all this kind of stuff. Um, so, so yeah, it's just about bringing them over like that. Um, and then it was like other places too, like I could, I could, um, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you ask the next question if you, if you have one. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was going to say like, so, this kind of theme of organization and keeping everything clean and also kind of that world that you're building. How did you come up with the, the themes or kind of the messages that you're talking about? You know, even, you know, the box King and yeah. the, how to, uh, does right. the organization. Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think it just came from like me thinking about like what, actually there are two different places. Um, one was like, I thought about like what I would like, from a brand, you know, how do I want to be addressed? Especially someone in, uh, like for a company like in the board game space, right? Like y- you should know what your audience is gonna, what, what they want to hear, like what they resonate with. And so for me, like I'm a super nerdy dude, I'm into medieval history and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, I know basically there's other people like that. There's a, there's a large amount of people in board gaming who, who are very much into like, you know, medieval history and culture and stuff like that. So um, I'm like, I'm like, I just know it's gonna be successful there. Um, the other thing is that like when you're doing uh, making a brand voice like that, you have to be willing to take risks. Like, you know, you're going to alienate some people, but you just have to forget about them. And so you just have to pick a, pick a theme and like stick with it. Uh, the second thing is that I had, uh, uh, I was also on the Shopify masters podcast and there was another dude on there who uh, had something similar before I, I created the brand. Um, uh, it's called the thing's called the beard bib. And he had a, he had a similar thing um, that it wasn't, I forget what he did. It was like treating someone like, some dude like treating someone like a king or something like that, um, like treating customers like kings. And then that's when I took that. I just, I just went to the next level with it. I was like, oh, that's pretty good, but also doesn't make any sense because it's like a beard product. I'm like, this would definitely make sense when you're building a box kingdom, you know, it's box throne and stuff like that, right? So I just took that kind of seed and I just planted it and just grew into a forest, I guess. That's amazing. That's yeah, I, I can see it in all the types of marketing that you're doing too, even like when you're writing for your updates and things like that, it all kind of just really comes out. Um and when you were, you know, in the campaign itself, right? 
how did you kind of get people to keep being excited about it? How did you kind of market in that middle part of the campaign? Yeah, like I think in the middle, like we we were pretty steady. Like I, we had a kind of a, a drop off in the middle. I mean, like every campaign does. But I think it's just because we had such a good first two days that the, the middle seemed very slow, but it was still constant. Um, and basically, like I got <clears throat> people to stay engaged by running the uh, Choose Your Own Adventure campaign. You know, like every two days, well, I actually had a timer on the rewards um, and the timer would hit zero and then release a new update. And in that update, it would have, you know, a chunk of the story and ask backers to comment. Like, do you want to go this way or do you want to go that way? And give me one reason why. And so, like, I would, I would do that. And we get, like, 100 comments, which would actually, when I was, when I was before the, the uh, we'd unlock all the stretch goals, like, we were able to get in the top 20 projects and stuff like that just from the engagement that we were having um, for, for, for board games, the board game category. Um, so yeah, so people people comments, we get like a hundred comments on the page and stuff like that. Um and uh for the next update I'd take the top comments that I found, like I, the funniest ones or the most interesting ones who voted for the winning side and I'd put those up there so everyone else could see them too in the next update. So then people kind of like want to also comment because maybe they think that if their comment's good enough, they might also make it to the next update and stuff like that. And it keeps people interested and engaged. And then having them vote just make and show the results of the vote. I think it makes makes people excited to read your updates. I think uh, that's why we had like hundreds of comments, like each 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 uh, each update, um, which really drove that engagement. Um, and then people feel like they're also helping create the project a little bit. I think that if you just a ask people straight up, like, "Oh, do you want the do you want to get a, a blue system or do you want to get a red system?" I think it I don't know takes the magic out of it a little bit. And sometimes people don't really necessarily know what they want as well and so like people want to i feel like people want to feel like they made a contribution but also don't necessarily want to deal with the pressure of having to make that choice and miss out on other choices so if you tell people you know pick red or blue you know they might not want to they might not feel happy making that choice but if you tell people oh do you want to go to the lava world or do you want to go to the, the ocean kingdom and then they pick the ocean kingdom and that unlocks the blue one you know so it's like um this is kind of correlated like that right um, they might feel like, oh, that's cool. I did have a contribution. And then without having to make that, that, that I don't know, I guess, rough choice of missing out on something if they picked the wrong way. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's like a really kind of involved stretch goal plan that you had, you know, that you mentioned that, you know, Jamie also blogged about it um, too mm -hmm. in his own blog. Um, can you talk us through like how you kind of planned out the stretch goals? How, how far ahead did you plan it out? Um, did you expect the types of answers you got? And how did you end up, did you end up releasing everything you wanted to release too? Yeah, uh, so yeah, basically like I wrote um, basically like the novella for like this choose your own adventure. Um, I wrote like, well, actually I should just take a step back. I got all the art done, all the add-ons done up like before I even planned this. So I'm like, I knew what add-ons I had and what I wanted to release. Um, and then I wrote the story out and then to fit those add-ons. So like I would look at the art that the, uh, the designers had made or the artists had made and I'd be like, okay, well, um, for example, um, uh, Naid, Naide? I don't know how to pronounce his, his name, but the artist of Takedo, right? He did one for us. Um, and it's kind of like a weird, bizarro version of like, uh, like a Super Mario Land kind of. And so we took that um, and, you know, it's called Pipe World. And I'm like, I, I just looked at those art plates and then just found a way to put that into the story. So like, oh, like maybe you go down a mysterious pipe and end up in Pipe World. And if you do that, you unlock, you know, these art plates that have that, that design on it. Um, so, uh, so basically I had all the art plates and I knew everything I wanted to unlock. And then I kind of wrote the story around that. Um, and the way I wrote the story is that like, there were stuff that would get missed out, but, uh, at the end of the story, uh, basically the backers would come across like the chest of wonders and the chest of wonders, you know, has, uh, is filled with the opportunities that were lost, you know, so they open it up and then that's how they get all the, uh, all the stretch goals that they might, might've missed along the way. And so in the end, yeah, everything gets unlocked. Oh yeah. That's, that's a really cool way to have everything beforehand and mm -hmm. then really plan out step-by-step step how people can unlock each one and also kind of a catch-all in a way to unlock all of them um, mm -hmm. that you've planned out. So from, from all of this, you know, like 
what kind of advice would you have for people who are kind of new into creating products um, and, and kind of running it on Kickstarter, right? Because, you know, after two really blockbuster buster successes, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of things that, you know, you wish you did or, you know, you kind of learned that you probably want to share. Yeah, I think, um, like, it depends, like, from a product design and, like, for the like, game design perspective, um, like, when it comes to the product, I think just the most key thing is just to be different from everyone else, right? You have to have something that really stands out. I actually think that if you're talking about Kickstarter in particular, you have to have something that's visually striking. This is why games with, like, great art that maybe don't have a fantastic design also do very well. Um, it's because such, such a visual medium it has to look good on camera. I think that's the most important thing to do when it comes to product design and game design um, for Kickstarter. Uh, from the marketing perspective, I, I just think the most important thing to do is do your research around like advertising and doing test ads and stuff like that with social media advertising to make sure uh, it's something that people want. Like, you know, when you're going to start doing email signups, you, you, you have to launch a Kickstarter with uh, an email list, right? It's like no question. So you should know that when you're building uh, uh, your email list, that the cost per sign up is indicative of how easily someone is going to convert on the page itself as well. So if it's costing you like five dollars for sign up, probably no one's going to buy you know back your project. If it's costing you ten cents for sign up, yeah, it's going to be huge. Um, and so you should start doing testing with that. I guess it's more applicable to like. Um, well, I guess it's applicable to, to board games as well, um, not just accessories. Um, but yeah, like you know that you should be able to hook someone with your art, for example, um, uh, if you're getting very low cost per signups. Um, yeah, and like the landing pages, I know like, like <laughs> we talked about this before on Facebook, but like landing pages and stuff like that is, is, is one great way to do it. But I prefer um, just doing the Facebook lead ads. I feel like the, the data you get is, it's very pure because it's someone just seeing the art, clicking it, and then giving you their email, right? It's like you can see if the key uh, promotional uh, aspect of the product, so whether it's like the, the striking visuals that you have of the product on the table or the key artwork that you have, whether that is good enough to hook someone to the campaign. Um, and so that's why I like doing Facebook lead ads and stuff like that to build that. Got it. Yeah, I would love to really kind of dig into that some more too, because um, a lot of people want to run large campaigns like Box Throne and like Token Sesame, right? And so I'd love to really understand kind of what channels you you ran advertising in, and kind of what types of testing and how intensive and how long, and maybe what types of budgets you were putting into all this yeah. pre-launch. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I, I think I rushed the Token Sesame launch a little bit. Like, I should have build, built the... Um, actually, like, I remember giving advice to someone on Facebook, and then, like, after I launched, I, now I have completely different advice for it. So, like, I spent maybe, like, three weeks on building pre-launch emails. And my logic was that, like, it's going to cost you the same amount no matter what. It's going to cost you a dollar for email sign-up. If you get done in three weeks, if you get done in three months, there's no difference in the budget. Um, so like after doing that, the experience, my experience has definitely changed. Um, and I would say that doing it for at least like six weeks to two months, probably six weeks, I'd say, um, is probably your best bet. It's probably the sweet spot. If you do it too long, building emails, people forget about you and you get a really low open rate. And then that will, you risk getting put in spam and stuff like that. Um, if you do it too short, the cost per sign up is massive because you have to compete with so many other people bidding for ads, right? So like if you can do it over six weeks, I didn't mind over three weeks. And I think in, by the end of it, I think I was paying like 175 per email sign up, which is still very good. But it, I, I think that it, when it started, it was 80 cents. And so you can see like condensing the window into three weeks is what caused that ramp up. And um, I've run other campaigns and stuff like that where we're taking a lot longer and we were able to keep it stable. Um, so like if you start the dollar sign up and it costs a dollar for sign up for the whole six weeks. Um, so I think in future, I'll probably do about six weeks of uh, Facebook lead ads in particular. Um, I, like, I, I do feel like the landing page, I just, like I understand how, you know, like other marketers will say that 
you get more qualified leads that way because they have to go on the page, read the stuff and sign up for it. I almost feel like Facebook lead ads don't actually have that issue because uh, you, it's, it's the same kind of principle, right? Like you've hooked someone with, uh, with you, uh, for example, you have a feature list in a, in a Facebook lead ad, like you can write that into there. Um, and also the most important visuals. And I feel like it's the same thing. Like, like you don't want to reveal, reveal too much on your, on your, on your, on your lead page because then people will be able to, um, I guess if you, if you reveal too much, people might just not be interested and all this kind of stuff. But uh, anyway, um, sorry, just I'm all over the place right now. Uh, yeah, I think that if you, I would, my advice would be Facebook lead ads to build up an email list. And when I launched Token Sesame, I had a, I had a separate email list not to do the box though because i wanted to do it you know uh pure like that just get get fresh people interested and that had about four thousand people on it and so a launch of that um as well as i had a twenty thousand person email list for 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 box them um as far as who pledged out of those it was actually even on like in the first 48 hours so it was as many people from the the four thousand list pledged from the twenty thousand list um so, so yeah, so that's what I had. And then during the campaign, I ran uh, Board Game Geek Ads. I did uh, Board Game Atlas as well, um, which, is, which is like a new kind of alternative to Board Game Geek. I went in their newsletter. Um, I had uh, a couple of Facebook groups. Some of Facebook groups like will never respond to you or like it's just so difficult to work with. But the one I really like is Board Game Revolution. Like Thomas Covert over there has been very helpful. Um, and I feel like it's great value for money. Like I think it spends two hundred seventy-five dollars, and his post brought in like over two thousand dollars. I think two thousand five hundred dollars. So if you're getting ten x on your ad return for anything, that's that's really good. Um, and then uh, yeah, then I just ran like Facebook ads as well. I used a company called Green Inbox for a while, uh, and ran my own Facebook ads. Um, so like, you know, like this was different advertising agencies like Jellup or uh, Green Inbox or Back of Kit ads that will take a percentage of the pledges that they bring in uh, versus you could do your own Facebook ads. So I was doing my own Facebook ads for, for a long time. Um, like uh, Carpenter Games and also my Kickstarter marketing agency together, I've done almost I, like we're about to launch our 10th Kickstarter campaign. Um, and in that time, I, I just I just cannot beat the return on ad spend I get from using a company like Jella or Backerkit Ads or Green Inbox. It's just like their level of technology. It's like you are actually saving money by using one of those agencies than by doing it yourself in a lot in a lot of uh, a lot of different product categories. For board games, I think it's like it depends on your on on, on your board game. For Token Sesame, for sure, like I was spending. When I was doing it myself, I think I was spending like $1,200 a day and maybe getting uh, like a three to one uh, return. Um, uh, when I was using a company like Green Inbox, I was getting six to one. So when I was doing myself, I was getting about a three to one return. When I was using Green Inbox, uh, to begin with, they were getting like a 10 to one return. And then after a while, it kind of, it kind of died off. Uh, I think by the end of it, they were doing about like a four to one return, three to one return, still very good. And then I swapped over to backer kit ads and they were able to get like um, about like a four to one return as well. Um, when I was doing it for myself at that point, like I was, it was like, it was like 2.5 to one. Um, and so, yeah, like I feel like you actually save money using those ad agencies. Um, the backer kit one is very good for, for board games because they have such a huge database of people who've backed board game products and that's how they build out all their ads. So the, and they're super easy to use and have a great dashboard, stuff like that. So backer kit one's very good. Um, I mean, the only problem is that then you have to use backer kit afterwards, um, which is, uh, kind of expensive. Um, so I think a company like Jellup is probably like, uh, another alternative too. Green Inbox is very good too, but they're very selective. They only take on four projects at once. So you have to book them well in advance and have like a really good, um, I guess, uh, proposal for them. Got it. Yeah, so if people are like new to um, crowdfunding to Kickstarter, they really want to kind of get their hands wet with um, ads, especially for the pre-launch section. What, 
what kind of things do they have to prepare? What kind of things do they have to know? What did you kind of learn how to do these ads yourself? Yeah, uh, yeah, I did the um, the Facebook lead ads. I did them them all from all, all by myself, right? Um, so, like, basically, it's, it's pretty simple. Like, all you have to do is go. Um, you should go onto Facebook, you know, and then you create a set of audiences. Um, I think for targeting board game people, it's pretty easy. You just need to make sure you target both board games. Uh, maybe list in a bunch of uh, well-known board games, you know, like uh, Ticket to Ride or, um, you know, some Simon games if they're there. Um, and then narrow down the interest as well. So, like, you want to have, like, so, like, board games in one um, interest, but also must match Kickstarter as well. That's how, that's how you get much more qualified leads. And then, yeah, and then you can just run uh, lead ads just doing that. And I would just say just build it up until you get, like, a email list of, I would say, it's if you want to, good campaign at least um 3000 people if you're just doing it as a small campaign you know like 1000 people is fine but 3000 people will give you like a very good day one i think you'll be able to fund day one kind of thing you'll be able to fund in like a few hours um which is what most people want right so i'd say keep doing that until you get at least a email sign up list of, of a list of 3000 but you have to make sure also to engage them like you can't just kind of like, kind of like build it and leave it you have to be able to you have to send them an email uh right away uh, not right away, but like within a few, a few couple of days of them signing up. Um, so I use Squarespace email to manage that. So I can see like what the new signups are and I can also have like uh, automated emails and stuff that go out. And, um, and yeah, so, so yeah, once you have like a, a good audience then you can just launch. Um, and yeah, that's, that's really all I did for my, my, my pre- like I do have a, uh, a landing page as well and people have found it organically or through going to boxer and stuff and learning more about the company and then and then finding it um but i would say facebook lead ads are the golden goose for me got it and are there any kind of uh, things that people should look for for like open rates or like clicks or anything for for emails yeah i mean like it, if you have a fresh account you and you manage it properly you could you could potentially get into people's primary inboxes instead of the promotional inboxes, for example, in Gmail. And the way to do that is that you have to be very careful about the ratio between like links to images to text in your emails. Um, basically, you can't seem too spammy by having like 50 links and like a thousand images. Um, so if you do that, uh, you can get open rates of like 80%. Like it's crazy. Like when I first did Box Zone, it's like that was what my open rates were like 80%. Like it was, it was insane on like a 3,000 person email list. Since then, I've become a lot more, I guess, graphic heavy and link heavy. And now we kind of land in people's promotional inboxes. So now it's like my, my open rate's about 30%. Um, and that's kind of like on an email that I send, maybe I maybe send like one email a month to my community or if that, like one email every two months kind of thing. Um, for, uh, during the Kickstarter and stuff like that too, like I, I sent out, you know, like a, a launch email and then like a mid campaign email telling people what have been locked. And then like a 72 hour email and a 24 hour email, like when the campaign's ending. And then as that goes, it's like the, the, the open rate drops off. So, you know, the launch email, you know, it's like a 40% open rate. Um, and by the time you get to the end, you know, your open rate's like 15%. But, but you should still send them out anyway because um, you never know who, who, who is waiting. Got it. Well, thank you so much for just coming on the show and just sharing all these insights. I know a lot of people are going to love just hearing about this product design phase and also how it, you know, translates into marketing and also, you know, what to do <laughs> to really, really crush their campaign. Um, if people want to learn more about Box Throne or Token Sesame or kind of find you online, where, where should they go? Uh, they can go to cloudpunchergames.com. Uh, they can also just uh, Google Boxzone, and that will take us to our website. Just uh, store my board games.com or boxzone.com. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then if they're interested in Token Sesame, then the, the late pledge is about to go live. And uh, yeah, they use the going to Kickstarter and search for Token Sesame. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dan. Great. Thanks, Alan. And that wraps up our episode today. If you found what we talked about today helpful in any way, please be sure to leave a review to help others find this podcast.
And most importantly, if you're feeling that fire and you're ready to get started on your Kickstarter campaign, be sure to head to the show notes of the podcast. I've linked some of my resources that others have used to successfully launch and get funded. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Board Game Marketing Podcast. For daily tips and advice, find us in the Board Game Marketing Group on Facebook. See you next week.